Well, a warm welcome to this talk. It's Friday the 16th of August. Now, a couple of days ago, last Wednesday, the Director General of the World Health Organization was talking about monkeypox, which they renamed as Mpox. And he announced a public health emergency of international concern or, or a fake P-H-E-I-C. Now, it's not for me to tell you what to think, so I'm going to give you the evidence for how risky this looks. But if you're dashing off to work um, and you just want the bottom line, I am concerned about the ongoing morbidity and mortality in Africa. There's been several hundred deaths. That's always bad. Way less than other transmissible diseases, way less than malaria, of course. But still, it's a disease causing problems in the Democratic Republic of Congo, particularly. We have had a case that's just come to Sweden, but that was a traveller from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Am I worried about ongoing sustained transmission in the West? At the moment, I think the probability of that is remarkably low. But uh, let's go through the details at the moment and then you can judge for yourself. Let's just listen to uh, the Director General first of all and very briefly. Today, the Emergency Committee met and advised me that in its view, the situation constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. I have accepted that advice. Well, there we have it. But on this channel, of course, we feel free to examine the evidence for ourselves and work out where the evidence is leading. Now, the evidence I'm going to take today is coming mostly from the World Health Organization itself, Centers for Disease Control in the United States and the UK government official data sources. Now, WHO, Wednesday the 14th of August, uh, announced this public health emergency of uh, international concern. Monkeypox virus, just by way of background, is a double-stranded DNA virus. Uh, we, of course, ourselves are double-stranded DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So this is not an RNA virus like sars coronavirus 2 It's a DNA virus. So it's a different type of virus uh, with different characteristics and it's not related to uh, chickenpox either it's a different sort of pox uh, virus um, it's in actually in the uh, smallpox family of uh, viruses not related to chickenpox as we said first seen in monkeys hence the name 1958 first human case was in 1970 now the key thing to grasp about this is there's two basic varieties and we know, of course, that viruses evolve, mutate and are changing, as we've learned from uh, COVID, uh, only too well. Now, um, clade one, this is the first grouping, clade one, the first sort of descendant, clade's a descendant group, really. I'm in my great, great grandfather's clade. Uh, causes more severe illness and death endemic to Central Africa. So this is the one that we're really more worried about at the moment, this clade one is of more concern. The clade two we've had for some time, that's what caused the global outbreak that started in 2022. But this is actually still going on. If we just give you the latest figures here from the United Kingdom, for example, uh, we still see that into 2024, we're having quite a few cases of uh, mpox or monkeypox. Uh, in, in fact, in July, uh, over 40 cases reported in the month. So this has been ongoing since 2022 albeit at a very low level, uh, virtually entirely uh, in relatively young men of the uh, work operating in the gay community, virtually entirely. In fact, I think entirely uh, so far in the UK. Um, now, uh, clade two. So that's when it began. Infections are less severe, uh, very high survival rate, uh, endemic to West Africa. So that's clade two. So that's separate from clade one is the current uh, argument that's being proposed. So it's clade one that people are currently worried about. Clade two has been rumbling on at a low level in particular communities since 2022. Now, Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo, they've got this clade one B, and this is the more aggressive form of the disease. It can cause more severe disease. Uh, it emerged first identified in 2023 in a sex worker. Been 15,000 infections so far in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they're saying 548 deaths. Now, of course, we can't really take any mortality figures from that. There have been way more cases than were officially diagnosed, of course. And of course, deaths can be from a variety of causes um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo 
obviously. So I don't think we can really take too much from that, but the consensus of opinion does seem to be that the morbidity and mortality is higher than the clade 2 that's been around for uh, some time and particularly since 2022. Um, spread to Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi and Uganda. Uh, so far, my contacts in Uganda have not seen any, uh, despite looking. So very minimal if, if it is uh, there as well. Uh, Sweden. Uh, there's been one clade one case amongst a returning traveller. So that's to be expected. I mean, if the, if the disease is endemic in a particular part of the world, you're going to get people coming back with it. We get people turning up in UK hospitals with malaria, for example, after travelling overseas not uh, an uncommon occurrence and basically would be expected the transmission person to person through close contact sorry my print has gone a bit funny there uh, close contact so person to person through close contact mostly skin to skin face to face droplet or short range aerosol but in the uk so far there's been no confirmed instances of airborne transmission so not looking like that really is a major cause of transmission no cases recorded in the uk limited household transmission has been seen in the uk and the assessment the confidence level trans transmitting primarily through close or sexual contact and we are moderately competent uh, moderately confident that that is the case in the uh, united kingdom so that's been the spread so far no reason really to think that this new clade type one should be transmitted in a different way it's basically the same virus it just it appears to be somewhat more virulent and certainly nothing that would concern me in terms of uh, ongoing sustained transmission from the information we have at the moment. Uh, other features, uh, skin to skin and sexual contact of course, uh, mouth to mucous membranes, no elaboration needed uh, there. Mouth to mouth potentially, especially if there's any lesions in the mouth and mouth to skin potentially if there's, especially if there's any lesions in the mouth or disruption to the skin. Uh, but basically, it's a reasonably hard disease to catch without uh, close physical contact, which is why so far a lot of the spread has been a uh, homosexual spread um, in the gay community so so far in the United Kingdom. Um, and similar situations in other countries. There have been over 30,000 cases in the United States. This is not uh, uncommon. Uh, it's, there's quite a few cases around the world following the 2022 uh, increase. Now, a uh, global outbreak that began in 2022, as we said, mostly sexual contact. Now, infectious period. Uh, this is the World Health Organization site until lesions have crusted over. So we get these lesions. Maybe just look at some of uh, what, what can go on here, actually. So this is the um, this is just the graphics from a newspaper. Uh, so the invasion stage, as you'd expect, headache, muscle pains, chills, fever, exhaustion, swollen glands, backache, of course common to a very wide variety of different viral infections, fairly non-specific signs there that we would expect by virtue of it's a viral infection. Um, these are the distribution of the blisters, the, uh, the, the pustular shot site by uh, blisters, uh, typically the feet, uh, groin, hands and uh, head uh, area. And uh, this is about how it spreads. We'll look at that now in a little more detail so um once these lesions so the, these are uh, uh pussy lesions form and then over a period of a week or so they'll dry out and they'll, they'll eventually uh, scab over so the infectious period is described as now when the infectious period begins isn't quite clear at the moment it could be that people are infectious before they develop the the pocky uh the, the pox lesions these pustules um if they are, it's probably they're probably not very infectious till that, till they develop these lesions. Um, but more more to come on that. And of course, we've known for centuries that this pus is transmissible. We know that uh, Edward Jenner, for example, took cowpox pus to uh, inoculate people against uh, smallpox by rubbing the pus into the the, the arm. The original uh, inoculations that were done on that. Um, so the saying. Um, until the scabs have fallen off and a new layer of skin have formed underneath, because a new layer of skin will be uh, healthy, that forms underneath the, uh, the uh, lesions. Until the lesions in the mouth, throat, eye, vagina and anus have healed, fairly obviously for uh, spread via those areas. Usually takes two to four weeks. 
virus can persist for some time on uh, textiles and objects. So if a, like if a person's got the infection, say from the pus on their hand, they took a, touch an object, what we call a fomite, can be transmitted in there, but also from towels and uh, bedding and such thing, the virus can persist for a period of time. And the viral entry is much more likely through uh, any cuts in the skin or also through the uh, nose, eyes and other mucous membranes. So that is sort of the spread. And also, this is a bit more concerning, during pregnancy to the baby. But of course, um, in Western countries especially, uh, we're not expecting there to be many cases, so hopefully pregnant women would not become uh, infected. Now, it is classed as a zoonosis, uh, zoonotic disease, because it first came from monkeys. Physical contact with an infected animal, monkeys, tree squirrels, or the rodents, particularly in Africa, but not likely method of spread in the UK, obviously. Bites or scratches from animals as well. Risk of severe disease, immunocompromised, of course, all infectious diseases, people with immunocompromised can get more. Children than, uh, younger than one year whose immune systems are not well developed. History of eczema because of the lesions in the skin and pregnant women, because in pregnancy there's a degree of uh, immunomodulation uh, to prevent the mum from rejecting the, the baby. So, the risk here, it seems to me, um, is close contact, uh, perhaps of a sexual nature, and then spread within the household. That is a possible, uh, a possible risk. Now, um, as I say, the likelihood of ongoing, um, ongoing transmission is remarkably low, I think. Um, it's going to be fairly obvious when people have got this disease, and it's going to be fairly obvious as long as people are moderately honest about it, who to avoid for a period of uh, time. And we know from the 2022 outbreak, there was behavioural change and increased awareness uh, that, that uh, did reduce the spread. Now, uh, there is a lot of talk about vaccines on this one. Now, vaccines, of course, have uh, had a uh, variable press, shall we say, over the past few years. And we make no secret on this channel, we are concerned about the uh, mRNA genetic vaccines and the adenovirus vector vaccines because we've looked at the adverse events associated with those. When you give an RNA vaccine, you can't really control the dose because the, the vaccine can go, well, we know the genetic material goes all around the body. Um, the antigen can be produced anywhere. That can lead to inflammatory effects. And we're generally concerned about that. And we'd like to see a monitorium on RNA vaccines. And indeed, adenovirus vector vaccines until we know much more about it. But the vaccine for uh, smallpox, monkeypox is not, I repeat, is not a genetic vaccine, at least yet. So it concerns me way less than the RNA uh, DNA genetic vaccines would. Just to give a little bit of detail on that, uh, the vaccine, This is there's three different ones, but they're all much the same variety. It derives from the uh, smallpox vaccine. Um, it is the trade name in the US, at least. It's made using weakened, so attenuated, live vaccine virus. This, this is the uh, CDC. They say it cannot cause smallpox, and I believe them. They say it cannot cause monkeypox, and I believe them. Uh, or any infectious disease, and again, I believe them, unless the sample was contaminated for some reason, but there's no reason why it should be. So it is not a genetic vaccine. It's a traditional antigen vaccine. With the traditional antigen vaccine, you can control the dose very precisely about the amount of antigen that you are getting. The level of immunity generated probably isn't that great. Last paper I read, it was about 66% protection after two doses, only about a 35% protection after one dose. But uh, we won't go into details on that because I'm just going from memory from a paper I read yesterday. Um, but it is not a genetic vaccine. Now, of course, this tells us nothing about how much money <laughs> manufacturers could make from the vaccine. Um, presumably, if there's a large-scale rollout, there'll be a lot of money involved. But it's not a genetic vaccine, so I'm not particularly worried about it. Although I would say no reason to get one for me personally, just to use me as an example. So there we are, uh, that is uh, monkeypox or mpox, um, a problem in Africa, not too worried about the West at the moment. Uh, let's hope that uh, not too fuss is made about it and this goes away fairly soon and fairly quietly. Uh, but for now, thank you for watching.